room. It wasn't a Mac, so I didn't know what to do with it when I first saw it. <laughs> I'd like you to turn, please, once again to the book of Acts and chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. I'm going to read uh, from verse 13 down to verse 32. Acts 13, <clears throat> verse 13 down to verse 32. So it begins this way. It says, now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel and ye that fear God, give audience. The God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an high arm brought he them out of it. And about the time of 40 years suffered he their manners in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. And after that, he gave unto them judges about the space of 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And afterwards, they desired a king. And God gave unto them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed hath God, according to the promise, raised unto Israel a savior, Jesus. When John had first preached before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think ye that I am? I am not he, but behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of, of, of this salvation sent. But they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. When they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead Amen. and he was seen many days of them which came up with him from galilee to jerusalem who are his witnesses unto the people and we declare unto you glad tidings how that the promise which was made unto the fathers god hath fulfilled the same unto us their children and that he hath raised up jesus again as it is also written in the second psalm Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. We'll stop reading there. Certainly God blesses the reading of his precious word. So we're now uh, in this third section of the Acts of the Apostles. Remember, we, we saw one through seven, it's all Jerusalem, and then eight through 12, Judea, Samaria. And now this final section is basically uh, from Antioch in Pisidia to the very ends of the earth. Uh, from Judea to the ends of the earth, the uttermost parts of the earth. And they've just, uh, missionary team have just finished their, their missionary trip to Cyprus, which we learned about last time. And now as we break into the, the story in verse 13, we want to notice that there's a major change taking place with the missionary team. It might not be obvious at first sight, but it really is there. Look at verse 13. It says, now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John departing from them returned to Jerusalem. 
one of the big changes is that it's now Paul and his company. Up to now, it's always been Barnabas who's taken the lead. I want you to notice that. Look back just chapter 12 and verse 25. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem. Uh, chapter 13, verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work where I have called them. Uh, verse 7 of chapter 13, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. And so you just notice this, that, that up to now, Barnabas has been the leader. After all, he went to get Paul. Remember that he got Saul and he brought him. And, and so he's always been the leading brother of the team. But now there's been a leadership change. From this point on, it's going to be Paul and his company. I want to just talk about that because that's a big change. Maybe it's such a big change that John Mark couldn't handle it. Because you notice that John bails out at this point. He's no longer going to be part of the team. He's, he's going back to Mama. That's what he's doing. Because it says in verse 13, John departing from them returned to Jerusalem. Now, why is he going back to Mama? Well, it's one thing to submit to Uncle Barnabas, you see, because Barnabas is related to John Mark. He's his nephew. So I, I, can, I can put, I mean, especially because Barnabas is such an encouraging brother, I can certainly submit to this guy's leadership. This fellow, Paul, I mean, he's, he's a bit of a stickler. You know, he's, a, he's driven. He's a kind of driven individual. I don't know that I can, I can, I can hang around with this man. I'm, I'm out of here. I'm leaving. And of course, this is going to cause all kinds of problems. Seeds are going to be sown in this very verse that are going to end up in a major split between Paul and Barnabas, a real uh, kind of humdinger of a row in chapter 15 between Paul and Barnabas all over John Mark. So it's kind of interesting uh, things that are happening. But the practical lessons we need to learn from this, because at least for this point, Barnabas is willing to take the second string in the orchestra you know he's willing to play second fiddle it, it's a it's a great man who has once been in leadership to actually be willing to step down and let those that he has mentored actually take the place of him in a sense because remember really all the encouragement Saul of Tarsus has got has has been from the ministry of this man Barnabas and now it seems like the, the one who was being mentored has now outstripped the one who has mentored him and is now taking on that leadership role. And I'll tell you, it takes a great man who has once been the leader to take a lower place. That's true greatness. I think Barnabas is a tremendous man that he's willing to do this and to relinquish control and willingly take that back seat. But it would seem for sure that John Mark, for whatever reason, he decided enough missionary work for him. I'm going home. He didn't even go back to Antioch to report to the assembly. He goes straight to Jerusalem, straight into Mama's arms. That's where he went. And, you know, the good news is we, we, we don't want to jump too far ahead. But the wonderful thing about the word of God is that although quite clearly this is a failure on the part of John Mark, and it was a failure. In the Bible, failure never has to be final. Amen. And the day, there's a day coming when Paul will even acknowledge, bring John Mark because he is profitable unto me for the ministry. And praise God for that, isn't it? That, that we, we need to be very hesitant at writing people off. Because who hasn't failed at some point in your Christian life? There's only one perfect man that's ever walked this earth and that's the lord jesus every one of us have failed at some point and therefore we need to be slow to write people off but certainly at this point uh john mark is done he's as far as missionary work is concerned i'm done i'm going home and of course we recognize that the mission field is not an easy place to be it's enemy territory Right now, they have walked into complete enemy territory. Just exactly where are they in their travels? Well, they, they've left the island of Cyprus, and they've come to 
Perga in Pamphylia, and then they're, they're going to make their way from Perga up into Antioch, verse 14, in Pisidia. Now, they left, it's a bit confusing because they left Antioch, right? But Antioch in Syria. You see, remember this guy, Antiochus Epiphanes? You remember that guy? Well, a lot of these guys had a phenomenal ego. And so when they conquer territory, they name cities after themselves. So there's quite a few Antiochs after Antiochus, you see, that's the idea. So there's one in Syria, but there's another one, and this is the one we're going to be going to. The one in Syria is where they were sent out for the work that the Lord had called them. Then I'm going to go to another one, which is in what we would call today Northern Turkey. And it's in the region that we would also call biblically Galatia. When Paul writes to the churches of the Galatians, well, one of the churches of the Galatians would be the church in Antioch in Pisidia. And so this is what they are doing. So as they go to this city, uh, their normal strategy, as we've learned so far, is that they would go to the synagogue first. Although they recognize their calling is to reach the Gentile world. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. And yet he, he loves his people and he can't ignore them. And so he always goes to the Jew first. Now he does it for two reasons. We've already said this because already they have two thirds of the story. They already have the Old Testament. Uh, and he's going to just, he's going to speak about that in his sermon. He's going he's gonna to give them highlights and overview of the Old Testament. And they'll all be nodding in their heads. They know exactly what he's talking about. Every reference he makes, you know, they don't have to look it up. They know it. They know this story like the back of their hands. They know it so well. So he goes there because they have two thirds of the story. They just need to hear the rest of the story. But there's another reason that he goes there too. And that is that in these synagogues, there were many of the very Gentile people that he wanted to reach because many of them had already become very disillusioned with paganism. The idolatry, the immorality of it, had caused a disgust in the Gentile world. And many of them had been attracted by the morality of Judaism. And so as we, as we see even here, it says, verse 14, when they were departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law, the prophets and rulers of the synagogue sent to them saying, ye men and brethren, if you have any word of exaltation for the people, say on. And then notice what Paul says. Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hands said, men of Israel. And then notice another group. And ye that fear God, give audience. Okay, two different groups. Men of Israel, okay, they're the natural born Jews. But then there's this other group, ye that fear God. And they, it's a term that is a technical term, the God fearers amongst the Gentiles. They don't buy into this paganism thing. They can see through it all. Uh, they, they, they actually do have a fear of God. They're concerned about the moral decadence of their world, and they're attracted to the synagogue. And so it's to these two groups that Paul has in mind as he wants to speak. And particularly, yes, he wants to reach his own people. He loves his own people, but he also recognizes God has called him to go to the Gentiles. And these Gentiles have already made a big step in, in moving away from paganism in coming to the synagogue. So he said, this is, this is a great place to begin my labors because I've got people already kind of halfway there. They're, they've already broken clear of the idolatry of that world. Now, maybe something we should think about when we consider the activities of the synagogue. What, what happened in these synagogues? What we know is kind, of, uh, is kind of interesting. And I would say this, that the New Testament church model that we follow is more akin to the synagogue model than it is to the temple. Okay? Remember, it, or, or I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. But one of the things that they, would happen in the synagogue is that they would have prayers, and then they would have scripture readings. There'd be an Old Testament reading from the Pentateuch, usually, and then there would be a reading from the prophets. And then, if there were visiting brethren, they would always be asked, do you have a word for the company? And that's exactly what they do here. After the reading of the law and the prophets, verse 15, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them saying, ye men and brethren, if you have any word of exaltation for the people, say on. 
Now, if you ever go to a gospel hall, now I'm just going to give you advance warning. If any of you go to gospel hall, first of all, two things. One, take a letter with you, okay? If you want to break bread, you have to have a letter of commendation from your assembly, okay? That number one. But number two, be prepared because they follow this very carefully. So if you're the visiting brother, they'll wait after the remembrance meeting. There's a time open for a word of exaltation. And guess who they wait for? The visiting brother. <laughs> I've been in that position where everybody's looking at you and they're going to say, well, you got a message for us. Now, if you eat on, they'll get up, but they'll, there'll be this long, awkward silence while they wait for you to get on your feet. And where do they get it from? I think they get it right from here. This is the, they're following closely the synagogue model. If a visiting brother, do you have any word for us? It's not all pre-planned, right? It's, it's, they don't even know who's going to be giving the ministry after the breaking of bread anyway. Any of the brothers that are excised can get up. And so there's this, you got any message for us? Well, <clears throat> on this particular day, they didn't know what they were letting themselves in for. <laughs> Man or brother, you got any word for us? And Paul, verse 16, stood up. <laughs> he said, oh, have I got a word for you. And I want to just contrast what his word is going to be in contrast to what normally would happen in the synagogue. And again, we were indebted to uh, some of the, 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 so the whole group of Jewish rabbis got converted to Christ in the early 1800s. Uh, amazing men, Adam Saf Safir was, was one of them, uh, uh, David Barron, uh, Edeshine, and they were, they were Jewish rabbis. And they had tremendous insight into their own history and culture. And they would tell you a little bit about the synagogue and how it all worked. And basically, uh, a typical Sabbath day on the synagogue, the, the word of exhortation would be to the people, well, you're not doing very well. You're supposed to be keeping the law, but you're really doing a poor job of it. And there'd be a big exhortation to try harder to keep the law. And that would be their message. Some of us have gone up in religious systems that don't have the gospel. We know what that's like. You know, you gotta, you gotta try harder. You gotta do better. You gotta be a nicer person. You gotta really work at this. That would be, that would be typical of what you would hear, right? Week after week after week, and uh, every week you'd fail, and then every week you get another whipping and say, "Come on, you gotta try harder and try harder and, and try." Well, that's all they usually heard. And Paul's message is going to be, don't work that way. You can't try harder. It's not going to help you. You're going to fail. His message is a real simple message. It is that your history teaches you that unless God came to your aid, you always failed. He had to provide deliverance. He had to provide a savior. He had to provide the help you needed. You couldn't do it yourself. And so that's going to be essentially his message. Very different to the regular message that was heard in the synagogue. In fact, it will culminate. Let me just jump ahead to verse 38 and 39. Just to show you, I'm not making this up. It says, be it known unto you, this verse 38, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him, all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Right? You, you can't keep the law of Moses to be right before God. It's impossible. It's through this man that you alone can be declared righteous before God through the Lord Jesus. So that's his essential message. You cannot be justified or declared righteous by keeping the law of Moses. Forgiveness of sins is not obtained by means of what the law says and our attempt to keep it, but by believing or trusting in God's promised deliverer. That's how a person is declared right in the sight of God. And you can imagine that when he gets to this climax, there'll be some of them saying, oh, that's too easy. Or they'll be saying, oh, that's easy believism. Oh, that's going to lead to loose living. That's going to lead. That's exactly what they're going to say, because they say it to this day, right? The legalists, if you say all you got to do is believe what Jesus Christ did on Calvary's cross, they're going to immediately say, oh, you teaching easy believism. 
too easy. You, you're gonna you're gonna live a, a morally, uh, you know, you've got to keep the law, you've got to obey, you've got to be good, you've got to do this, 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 and this. It's all about what you've got to do rather than what he has done. And that's human religion. It's all do, 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 do. And God given redemption is all about done, done, done. Amen. And that's what this message is. Now we're going to look at it. We're going to break it down. It's a, it's, it's interesting that Paul's, we, we know Paul preached before. We, we, we discovered that when we saw that he was in Damascus, but this is actually the first recorded preaching of the apostle Paul in the new Testament. And by the way, it's hard not to read this and already see the seeds of Romans and Galatians and all of his preaching right here. You can see it in seed form in this first sermon. It also happens to be the longest sermon in the book of Acts. <laughs> that tells you something about the Apostle Paul, right? You, get, you got a word. Oh, I've got a word for you. And then he gives this long <laughs> sermon. And uh, uh, like Jabe Nicholson, I guess Paul could say, I may be long, but I'm never winded. And uh, he always had something to say. And so as we, we look at this, we want to consider it together. Uh, notice as he begins to preach, he begins to remind them about their history. So he's going to, he's going to go through kind of an overview first of the Old Testament history, just to, to get them ready, to prepare them for where he wants them to be. And, and so he, he talks about the, the, I guess we would say from, from Egypt to Canaan in the first section, uh, some of the old preachers used to come around and they'd have charts. And one of the big charts, they would take you from Egypt to Canaan. That would be part of, well, he's going to do that. It's going to be a 450 year period that he's going to take us from Egypt to Canaan. And then we're going to go into the period of the judges and we're going to have another 450 year period. And he's going to take us through that. And so he's going to do an amazing overview. By the way, it is remarkable how these preachers of the New Testament, how familiar they were. Of course, they're all Jews, but they knew their Old Testament. When Stephen preached, remember in Acts 7, he didn't go home and say, let me get my notes. He just stood there and it flowed out of him. He had a great grasp of the flow that what we call the history of redemption the flow of 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 old testament history he knew it and certainly we see the very same thing here with the apostle paul uh, many, the minute somebody says anybody got a word for us he's he's at it okay i can do this and he begins and he goes right through the old testament and it would be be a, a challenge to us to just try and put yourself in that scenario okay imagine you go visit a church and somebody says, okay, brother, if you got a message, preacher didn't show up today, you're it. And by the way, we haven't had an overview of the Old Testament for a long time. Would you mind giving us an overview of the Old Testament? Just the main flow. We don't want every detail. Could we do it? These guys could do it. They knew exactly how to do it. They were so familiar. And how did, they, how did that happen? Well, because they spent a lot of time meditating on the text of scripture and they, they had it it was in them and they knew how to communicate it now i want to just give you a little bit of a contrast between stephen's sermon in Acts 7 and paul's here in Acts 13 both of them give overviews of the old testament but both of them are going to give a completely different emphasis because there's a different reason in in their giving their sermons Stephen's sermon, and I'm sure you don't remember it, we, we went through it quite a while ago, but his overall message is this, every time God has initiated change, you've resisted it tooth and nail. Everything is brought, anytime he's brought something in new, you've been against it, you've resisted, you've resisted change every step of the way. That was the emphasis of Stephen's message. Now, Paul is going through the same storyline but he's a different emphasis. And his emphasis is going to be this. You never, ever could deliver, deliver yourself no matter what situation you were in. You couldn't deliver yourself from Egypt in the first place. Uh, when you were in crisis in the book of Judges, God had to raise up deliverers. You couldn't deliver yourself. Every step when you went into the land of Canaan, you couldn't pull the walls of Jericho down. You couldn't cross the Jordan River at flood time. You couldn't do any of this stuff. Unless God did it, 
you couldn't do it. It wouldn't happen, right? And again, he, there's a reason because he wants to tell you that when it comes to your soul's salvation, he wants you to get the message. You can't do it. Somebody else has got to do the work for you, okay? So the emphasis, simple emphasis that he's going to give. So we just wanted to kind of lay that foundation as we go in from verse 17. And I want you to notice the, the word he uh, in this little section. So it says, the God of the people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt and with an high arm brought he, them, out of it. How did they get out of Egypt? Like, were they able to overthrow throw Pharaoh themselves? And, no, they were cowering slaves, weren't they? And they couldn't do anything. But God brought them out with a high arm, right? That's what he did. He, we know the stories, right? And he's just reminding them, you didn't deliver yourself. God did it. He was the one who brought this amazing deliverance. They couldn't do it themselves. It was an impossibility. And so they were, they were 400 years of oppression in Egypt. And then when God determined the right time, he delivered them. And he did it by power and by blood. That's what he did, right? He delivered them in a powerful way. And so it says, not only that, after he delivered them, it says in verse 18, and about the time of 40 years, suffered he their manners in the wilderness. Isn't that a nice way of putting it? He, yeah. he, he put up with their manners in the wilderness. And they were not well-mannered, were they? They were complaining. They were belly aching. They were, in fact, they were so bad that there was one stage that God has said, I'm, I'm done with these people. I'm going to wipe them out and start again, right? And it was only the fact of the intercessory work of Moses that God didn't wipe them out. And in fact, he actually waited till the whole, the whole generation died in the desert. But, but again, uh, who's active here? He, he suffered their manners in the wilderness. Left to themselves, what did they do? They made a complete mess of things. And if it wasn't for him, they would have been wiped out completely. It was his grace and mercy that preserved them. And verse 19, and when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. And again, the emphasis is, look what God did for you. What, what you did, it's what God did, right? You couldn't, there's no way that you could have torn down the walls of Jericho yourself. You couldn't have done it. It was, it was a work of God, wasn't it? I mean, even crossing Jordan, I was just reading about that this morning, that it was in the spring of the year. And the, the Jordan River, at that time, when it's in flood, not only do you have the spring rains that cause the river to swell, but you also have the melt from the mountains of Lebanon. So it's, it's, it's when the Jordan River is at its peak, that's when they cross to go into the land. Now, if it was left to themselves, it would be dangerous even to try to swim it, never mind two to three million people go across that land with all their women and children. All There's no way they could do that. It was only God that opened the way. He brought them in. He delivered those seven nations into their hands. And so, again, he just wants them to see this overall message of their history is that if anything good has ever happened to them, it's only because what God did, not because of them. Left to themselves, they always messed it up. And then verse 20, it says, and after that, he gave them judges about the space of 450 years. So we had the first 450 years, 400 years in Egypt, uh, we had 40 years in the wilderness, and then we had 10 years in the conquest of Canaan, 450. Okay, he just kind of summarizing the Old Testament era in that way. And now another 450 years, what we call the judges cycles. Remember how they kept rebelling against God and all the rest of it. And, and so what happened? It says, and after that, he gave them judges about the space of 450 years until Samuel the prophet. Well, let's just ask, what, what does that mean? He gave them judges. Why did they need judges? What was the purpose of these judges? Well, we don't have to look very far. Go with me back just to the book of Judges just for a second. And we're going to see this overwhelming, simple message 
that God raised up these saviors or deliverers to deliver them from their oppression. Chapter 2, verse 18 of Judges. And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge, for it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. Chapter 3, verse 9. It says, and when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel, who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. Chapter 3, verse 15. Again, we just see this pattern. But when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer. Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a man left-handed, and by him the children of Israel sent a present to Eglon, the king of Moab. And so God raised up deliverers when they got desperate because of their own failure that had brought about oppression, their failure to do what? Their failure to keep the law, right? They, they, they went after the idols of the nations. They didn't pay attention to Deuteronomy. They didn't pay attention to God's word. And then as a result of that, God sent oppressors. And then in their desperation, they cried out. And guess what God did? He raised up judges who were deliverers and saviors who saved them from themselves and from their enemies. And that's the, the, the story up to now. And so again, uh, why are they exalting them to keep the law and be good when their whole history says they've always failed to do it, right? I mean, they have a, they have a perfect track record of failure. And now they're, they're back again, exalting them to do the same thing. And it's not going to work. It's not going to help them because they've never been able to do it up to now. And why do they think anything is going to change? And afterwards, verse 21, they desired a king. And God gave unto them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin by the space of 40 years. So after all their failure during the time, they said, we're tired of crying out to you for judges. Just give us a king like all the other nations. We want to be like everybody else. Well, he gave them the kind of king that they had in mind. The very king that they wanted. He was tall. He was good looking. He was just their ideal of a king. But he was a disaster, wasn't he? Twice he led the nation in deliberate disobedience and critical moments. He proved unequal to facing the Philistine champion Goliath in combat. And worse still, when God raised up David, who saved both the nation and Saul, Saul rejected and persecuted his God-given deliverer and drove him out of the country. Yes, this was the people's idea of a king. And so God said, okay, I'll give you what you want. But thankfully, it says, verse 22, and when he had removed him, he raised unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. And we know David was a far from perfect individual, but he did accomplish all that God had sent him to do. What did God send him to do? He called him to save them from the Philistines and their enemies, to lay a foundation for their reign of peace under Solomon. And David did all of those things, and he was a man after my own heart, and he was determined to fulfill all his will. So now we come to verse 23, because this is where he's trying to bring us to this, to this glorious moment. He said, of this man's seed, this man David, of his seed, an offspring of David, God, hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. See, that's where he wants to get. You know, you can tell where he's going. But, and he's finally got there, and he's got to find a segue in. And David's a great segue. Actually, he's going to be a direct descendant of David. God is going to raise up a savior who's going to save you from the real core problem. Why do you keep going back and failing and failing and failing and failing? Well, there's a core problem. There's a heart problem. It's a problem of sin. 
And this David's descendant is going to deliver you like no one else. He's going to bring a, a, a core change of your personality. He is going to, he's going to bring true freedom and true liberty to you. He's going to be the one who will save you. This one, Jesus. And so it says concerning this one, Jesus, it says of whom John the Baptist had first preached before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. Now, remember that although they're in Turkey, they're in a synagogue. Now, all the Jewish males, what was required of them, wherever they lived in the diaspora, they had three times a year they had to go home, right, to Jerusalem for the festivals. Do you remember that? They had to go at Passover. They had to be there at Pentecost, and they had to be there for the, the fall festivals, trumpets and, and those ones that followed. They had to be there, uh, the tabernacles being the big one. It was they were required. It was mandatory, and so although <clears throat> these people lived in Turkey, they would have known all about John the Baptizer. Because when they would have gone to Jerusalem, you know, first thing they want to know is, well, what's all the gossip from the home country? What's going on? Anything new happening, guys? You know, you know how we are. We want to know what did we miss? You know, I mean, as soon as Kurt came in the door, well, what went on? I, I, what, I'm only teasing, we didn't say that. But you know how we want to know what's, what's happening? What's the story? And the big story would have been in those years, well, there's this strange preacher in the wilderness. Uh, he's really, he's got a strange diet. He dresses really weird. And, and yet people are flocking to hear him from all over. And so they would have, Word would come back to them about John's ministry. And so he wants them to know this, this one that's the promised deliverer, one John. Now, John was coming to prepare the way. He wasn't the way. He was preparing the way, right? He was making straight the ways of the Lord. And so it says, when John had preached before his, his, his coming, the baptism of repentance, he was coming to get the people ready to, to, to turn their back on their false ideas. Uh, for all the people of Israel. And as John fulfilled this course, he said, whom do you think that I am? I am not he. Behold, there cometh one after me whose shoes, his feet, I am not worthy to lose. I'm not even worthy to untie his shoelaces. It's interesting, isn't it? That the Lord said that, that of the sons born of men, there was none greater than John the Baptist. Isn't that amazing? And yet John says, and I'm not even worthy to tie the shoes of the Lord Jesus. John had a wonderful attitude, didn't he, to the Lord Jesus. He must increase. I must decrease. And so <clears throat> John prepared the way. And so then he says, after John had fulfilled his cause, verse 26, men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. In other words, the reason God sent Jesus Christ into the world was for people just like you. Who week after week have been exalted to do better and you can't do better. And, and have been tired of being exalted to do better. And, and you're utterly frustrated. I keep saying, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying, and I can't get there. It's to people like you is this word of salvation being sent. And isn't it wonderful that there is a person who is being sent. As we heard this morning at the breaking of bread. Who did he come into the world for? To save sinners. Who did he come for? N not those that are well, but those that are sick. He, he came to heal those that were spiritually sick and unclean and needed deliverance and needed a savior. Folks, our world, with all its cleverness and all its sophistication, you know what our world needs? This Jesus. Amen. He's the only hope for Western civilization. He's the only hope for the, the masses in the Far East. He's the only hope for the, uh, the, the multitudes in, 
in Europe's new dark continent. The only hope is found in the person of Jesus Christ. Human beings cannot pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Doesn't work. Man's history has proved self-improvement doesn't improve. <laughs> it doesn't. Only Christ can change a man. Amen. Only Christ can change the whole trajectory of a person's life. And to take a drunkard and make him sober. And to, 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 uh, to take an, a, 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 an adulterer and, and, and save him and make him a man who is committed to purity and holiness in his marriage. Only the gospel can do these things. Nothing else. Brethren, we have this message. It's come to us. To you is the word of this salvation sent. Aren't you glad it came to you? Amen. I'm glad I heard this message. But it's not to stop at you. It came to you. Just like it came to the ears of Paul. But Paul said, it's not going to stop with me. Every chance I get, it's going to go through me to others. And we need to be asking, Lord, help us. Lord, is there some soul that I can share about the Lord Jesus? Now, this, we said it's the longest sermon. And I just knew when I was preparing this that I wasn't going to get very far this morning. So we'll have to revisit this sermon again. But I hope we're getting a simple message. Uh, long, but it's not complicated. It's pretty simple. You cannot save yourself. You need a savior. Amen. Father, we're so thankful for providing such a savior in the person of the Lord Jesus. And when we were without strength, the word of God says, nothing we could do. We just couldn't pull ourselves up by our bootstraps anymore. At that time, you sent the Lord Jesus into the world to save sinners. Oh, Father, how thankful we are for the day that we heard those glad tidings. Oh, thankful, Father, we are for the day that we, we stopped trusting in our own efforts and trusted in the finished work of the Lord Jesus. Oh, what a difference it has made. All eternity, we will be praising the Lamb as it had been freshly slain for the work that he did for us on Calvary. Help us to just thrill afresh with this message today. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we give thee thanks. Amen. Amen. Something just came to mind, and I was just thinking about this. Just imagine who we would be without Jesus in our lives. Amen. What we would have become. Amen. Would it be pretty? No, not say. at all. <laughs> That's a cool name. Hey, parents have good taste.
because just like you are, yeah. put a mask on because yeah. everybody's wearing masks. So, got it. It does. So you have to sit out the sun for a while. Keep all those ways. Yeah. Let me see your. Do you have a bike? Where is your bike? Is that your bike? Look at that. It's a motorcycle. Yeah, but I got a new uh, bike bike for Mike. Yeah, yeah but that baby pink one that Kyle can. It's good. Nicolay. I now get some toy on are you glad to be back? Tired? I'm not tired, but we had a really good time. Good. What camp did you go to? It was called Black Diamond Camp. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I get on a date. So it was more of a retreat center, you know, that's what he was looking for, I guess, you know, in regards to accommodations. Because I was like, why don't we do it at Tricky Hill? Everyone's mainly on the middle, midwest, east side. Yeah. He's like, well, he's looking for something that was more. Cause they, well, they had bedding, but it wasn't like the still not my favorite. Yeah. Your daughter, also uh, Kathleen, said it was a big place, and we drove a long time. It was so cute. Yep, I can imagine. Yeah. So we stayed with the Kemp's the last two nights. That was fun. We had a good time. The kids. They got two, ten and eight. Uh, Silas and Sarah. So they had fun together. We all drove up to Pike Peak. Barry drove <laughs> so Kurt could look. <laughs> yeah. But we couldn't go all the way to the top because there was snow. So we only got to like 13, the mile marker or the yeah. interest point 13, and there's 20. I so, said when we did that a few years ago. Well, maybe I think I, would, I think if we would have gone to the top, I think I was going to get sick because I was already starting to feel a little like yeah, just kind of don't talk to me. I need a well. That's why when we were coming down, they kept saying, "Oh, it's there's so no cool. Green. It's green in the dark. It's yeah. like super bright. It looks like it's a ghost." Like, like it's like I don't think she meant it so it would look like a ghost. <laughs> well, like like floating in the air like a ghost. Yeah, <laughs> it's a grass. <laughs> well, because when you have something in your hand to do, you want to do something like that. <laughs> but I didn't think it'd make noise. I hear more of the noise than I thought I would. Oh yeah, they do that. Puppets, How are you guys getting along? Doing good? Well, you're amazing. I can't believe you're getting around and you have some remarkable. He said, well, I don't have a leg to stand on anyway, so. I thought, okay, take it that way. <laughs> well, I'm buried in laundry. And, oh, I'm sure. And putting stuff away. Because we don't really have anywhere, you know, like a entryway or a... Uh, what they call oh, those rooms, like yeah. mud room. a mud room, yeah, where it's yeah. all like you just dump it, it's just like all the dumps in that. 
Yeah. I know when I used to come home from camp, you open up your suitcase and there's all the clothes, you know, dirty clothes. Wonder what I'm going to wear tomorrow to Sunday school, you know. <laughs> they did have a, a washing machine just down the hall at the camp, so I tried to get it all caught up last Sunday before we left. And that helped. Yeah. But uh, I put the little kids' clothes like in a plastic three door thing. Right. And then if we were just staying like one or two nights, I just grab and put it on a backpack and they could just carry their own backpack in. So that was helpful about them. Because when I had taken the suitcase and they yeah, <laughs> and then you have the bullet, but I guess, yeah, so that made it a little easier. Well, I know girls would they would do Girl Scouts, or they have a camp out. They taught them to take these big five gallon bags, put one outfit in there, everything's together. You just have that one to take it. Okay, so. Because yeah. they were sleeping outside the yeah. moisture and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought that's a great oh, that's idea. A, that is a good idea. I didn't keep that one in mind. That's yep. a great idea. Yeah. That helps not contaminate your whole right. body of clothing. Right. Well, good to see you guys. You too. Glad you're back. <laughs> back. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the skirt go back to work tomorrow. tomorrow. No, they had almost all the chaplains there except for three. One was the toy. Tony Hart had something he had going on at the church, so he couldn't get away. And then one other one was still, he couldn't get away either. He's in the Navy Reserve. So it was a big group. That and all the kids, the kids loved it. Yeah. 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 Right, right. Yeah. Well, one family is in Louisiana and one family. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, they're all military chaplains except I think they have three, three or four. I don't know. We don't need to go change. We're going home, sir. <laughs> no. You do need to come get your buddies. A swimsuit. Your buddies are going to be left here. You better come get them. They're going to be lost. Yeah. If, if they want to. Right. Just get it back. Let me see that. What is that? Deco? Is that the bus? Elevator? Yes, it's a lizard. It's called it Rainbow Um, we went to go see the redwoods. Wow, those are 
Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies, can we back in? Yeah. 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 Y